Here we are on the front of our Corterra Travel Trailer by Heartland. We're going to do a tutorial of this unit, let you know how everything works on it, just like technician would do on the day of delivery. If your unit varies in brand name for some of these items or you want a deeper dive on them, you can find that in our Haps Helpful Hacks section playlist of our Great American RV YouTube channel. Click like, subscribe, do all those things to help support the information that we're giving you. On the front here, we're going to start with our seven-way plug, transfers all of your lights and everything from your towing vehicle to the trailer. We also have a battery charge line that will pull off the alternator of your towing vehicle to help charge your battery while you're traveling down the road. And lastly, we have our brake control wire that sends the signal from our brake controller to our brakes on our trailer, signaling it to stop when you hit that brake pedal. Now also for braking, we also have our breakaway box down here. This little lanyard right here needs to be hooked up to your receiver hitch where you would hook your chains up to it, not to the hitch itself, not to the chains. The idea is if anything fails with the chains and the hitch, this will actually pull out of that box and activate our brakes on our trailer, bringing it to a stop. This will bring it to a safe stop, but it only happen if we have a solid 12 volt battery back here with actual good voltage. If we don't, there's not going to be any power to signal for these brakes to activate. So we need to make sure we have a good 12 volts. We also need to make sure that pin is in that box at all times. In the event that it isn't and pulled out, your emergency brakes will be activated on your trailer and you can burn up your brakes. In the front, we have our 12 volt jack up and down, our light on the front. We have a black cap on the top. We can insert our crank handle and override this system if we wish. We do have a wire going down for power on this. So you're gonna have an inline fuse on there in the event that you're not sure what's going on with it, it's not working, we can check that fuse. We also wanna check our power on here as well. Make sure we have a good solid battery. Behind that, we have our dual propane tanks, which are controlled by our dual propane regulator. That dual propane regulator has a little selector switch on there we can see. We'd have both tanks on. We choose which tank we want to be our primary. And when that tank runs dry, it'll start pulling from the secondary tank automatically. Now, when that tank runs dry, of course you're out, but if you notice that that primary tank is empty based on the signal on the regulator itself, we can go ahead and swap over to that secondary tank. It will mainly pull off of that one. We can get our former primary tank refilled or replaced. Behind that, we have our 12 volt battery storage, and we also have a battery disconnect. A battery disconnect is used when we store our unit plugged in. We want to make sure it's on or anytime we're camping, as long as it's plugged in, that disconnect needs to stay on so our battery charging system is charging our battery. But if it is stored unplugged, we need to turn that off so it'll help conserve the power on that battery. We'll notice before the slide out, we have one of our gray tanks right here. This is that port. We'll have a second one in the back with our black tank. We'll go over the dumping instructions when we get back there. Our slide out is an electric slide out. It's a rack and pinion. You have a motor in the underbelly, you can't see it, but there is a hole on the opposite side over there that will show you, you can put your crank handle in there and manually run that slide in and out in the event that you have a failure of the motor. Behind our slide out, we have our quick connect for our spray port. If we wanna put that coiled hose on there, we can have that spray port. City water connection, that's if you have a water bib at the campsite, you run your hose over here and have city water. We have our black tank flush. We'll talk about with our sewage right here in a minute. And our saddle, satellite and cable hookup right here, as, long as, as well as our 50 amp power supply. That 50 amp power cord is gonna go in, turn it to the right and lock it in. We have a little retainer ring. We wanna go ahead and tighten up so that plug can't fall out. Kids don't accidentally grab it, yank it, trip over it, whatever. And then we also wanna make sure we plug this in then first and then plug into our shore power. That way we don't have any arcing when we plug this in at the plug. And then we also wanna make sure our AC systems are off so we don't have any surges to those appliances. Now behind me here, we have our gray tank and our black tank valves. Remember we talked about we have another gray tank connection up front. We'll run those hoses together. You can get a Y pipe connection and have it go into one spot there at the dump site. Now some campgrounds have dump sites there at the spots. Some of them you have to wait until you leave. So obviously if you have to wait till you leave, these valves stay closed all the time till you're ready to dump. If you have the site there, if you have drainage there at your site, we can go ahead and run these hoses and your two gray tanks you can leave open all the time. That's your sink water and your shower water. No point in having to go open and close that. You can go ahead and let it flow constantly. That way you don't have to keep coming out and emptying it out. Your black tank, however, that valve needs to stay closed all the time. We want to make sure we're keeping water in that black tank so the solids, which is from our toilet, our sewage, right, 
that doesn't get dried up in our tank. If it does, then it's not going to be easy to get out, if at all possible. So I have your line hooked up when you're ready to dump. You come over here, you pull that black tank valve, and let that flow out. During that period, we'll have a hose hooked up to our black tank flush, which will lead to a jet port on the other side of that tank. Turn our water hose on, and that helps flush that tank and go ahead and get any debris that's in there out. Now that's how we're going to dump it. When we're done, we disconnect that black tank flush, close this valve, go to our toilet on the inside, hold that pedal down, put several gallons of fresh, clean water in there. It's going to help while you're driving down the road, knock some stuff off the wall, but it's also going to keep any contaminants that are in there from drying up. We drop our chemicals in there to help decompose anything that might still be in that tank and, of course, help it smell nice. Now, now that's how the owner's manual is going to tell you how to do it. There are some pro tips on how to do that. We've got that video in our HAPS Helpful Hacks section if you want to go check it out. Here on the back of our unit, we are pre-wired for that Furion backup camera system powered on when we turn our running lights on on our towing vehicle. It'll turn the lights on our trailer and power up our camera system so we can see behind us while we're traveling down the road or backing up if you want to upgrade to that camera. Our bumper has caps on each side. We can go ahead and pull those off and store our sewer hose in there if we wish. We're also equipped with that Lippard on-the-go ladder system, telescopic ladder we can purchase to be able to gain access to our roof. Now that's very important because we need to check our sealants on our roof every 60 to 90 days, as well as the sealant around all of our trim, our windows, our water heaters, anywhere where you saw a hole put in the side of your unit, I guarantee you there's silicone around it. We need to check that sealant as well as that roof sealant, even if you have it under a cover, every 60 to 90 days. We're looking for any cracking, peeling, deterioration of that sealant. We want to go ahead and clean it, seal over it. If we're not maintaining our camper, then that's going to allow water to get in it and ruin it. And manufacturers aren't going to participate in that kind of repair. So every 60 to 90 days, it's in your owner's manual. Make sure you're checking that sealant. We also need to get up and clean our roof at least twice a year. Make sure we're keeping it clean and we need to check that rubber after trips to check for any low-lying tree limbs that might have poked any holes in it. Lastly, we have our Dometic water heater, electric and propane. We'll go over that operation when we get inside. On our pasture side, we have more access to our pass-through bay. We have our solar charge controller right here. Solar power on the roof will help charge that battery system. Even if you're not plugged in or you are plugged in, that solar will kick in and help change that solar voltage into charging voltage for your battery. You can control what type of battery you have set up in that system through that uh, display right there. We also have our Lippard Tire Link system. If we wanted to upgrade by the sensors for our tires and the monitor in here, it, the wiring is already ran for the power for that system, so we can monitor our tires. We have our solar disconnect right next to it. That solar disconnect is going to be completely different from our battery disconnect. If we don't want our solar on, we turn that off. If we turn off our battery disconnect when we store our unit unplugged, still leave that solar on, it'll still charge that battery. Down here we have our stabilizer jacks, extend and retract, push of a button, 12 volt powered, and I say stabilizers because they are meant to reduce the amount of movement that you feel in your unit, not level it. So in order to level your unit, you'll purchase those stacker blocks, put them under your tires to be able to level it from left to right as you're backing up into your site. Now then you use your tongue jack to level it from front to back. Then we go ahead and extend these stabilizers down in the front and the rear, have them push, put down on the ground, put a little bit of pressure on them and that's it. We don't want to try to lift the camper with them. You will bend and break these jacks. Now there is an override on them in the event that the motor goes out. It's on the other side we mentioned. You get that crank handle, put it in there. Then you can manually run that stabilizer system back up if need be. Our awning is mainly a sunshade, not really intended for rain, but it can withstand a little bit. We may have some dew condensation from our AC up there, so on and so forth. But during storms, we want to go ahead and bring it in. Uh, during high winds, bring it in. You're leaving your unit for an extended period of time, bring it in so you don't come back with a catastrophe and an insurance claim. When we do put it out, we want to make sure we lean it to the front or the rear, this side being the rear. Both awning arms are the same. You would loosen this knob right here and go ahead and just pull down on your awning arm, tighten this up, and then we have now leaned our awning over. When we're ready to store it, we need to make sure that both of these knobs are loose on both sides to run that awning in. 12 volt power, just like our awning lights, will show you where the fuse panel is that powers it up. Moving down the driver's side, if we look right under here, we'll see a red and blue line. Those are our loop, low point drains sticking out of the underbelly. 
We use those for winterization when we want to prepare our unit for the winter time. You can refer to your owner's manual for more info on that or check out our video on HAPS Helpful Hacks. This is the exhaust for our Suburban Furnace 12 volt powered propane to go ahead and heat it. Go over the operation of that when we get to our thermostat. On the inside, this is our fresh tank fill. Wanna, that's the onboard storage that uh, we have on our unit if we want to bring water with us. Going somewhere that doesn't have water, we like to use it at rest areas, so on and so forth. Pull that cap off, stick a water hose in there, and we can fill that tank. Now there is a valve to empty that out right under here, a little white pool valve that will empty out that fresh tank. We want to go ahead and do that when we're not using that water. It does add extra weight to our unit. So if you don't need it, dump it out. We also don't want to keep it in there for an extended period of time. Let that water go stagnant in that tank. Next to it, we do have our cable output for our outdoor TV as well as our GFCI protected outlets. We'll go over the GFCI protected part when we get to the inside. Here in our outdoor kitchen area, we do have our gas griddle. We go ahead and take that out. We flip the cover over. We do have a connection right here. This is the male connection. We have a female quick connect down there at the bottom. In order to insert this, the valve must be off for that quick connect to go in there and then turn the valve on so the gas will flow out. Now, once we're done, we to disconnect it. Once again, valve off to be able to disconnect that system. Whenever we store our griddle, we need to make sure that travel latch is on there. That way it can't bump out and hit our door. We have our 110 dorm refrigerator right here. It does have a little freezer section up there up top. Anytime we plug in our unit, that system is going to turn on. We're going to end up having a little freezing in the freezer, condensation in the fridge, more likely if it's warm. Anytime you unplug it, it's going to defrost. We need to make sure we air that refrigerator out after we're done, defrost the freezer area, and get all the water out of there. If that water leaks out, it can damage our wood components around our fridge. Manufacturers aren't going to cover that type of repair. It's considered customer maintenance to defrost and clean your refrigerator properly. It's also going to help reduce the opportunity for mold and mildew. We have another stabilizer jack here in the rear with our controls right there. We can see our vent up top. That is for our over our stove, our hood range vent. It does have a couple tabs in there. We want to go ahead and make sure those are open so it'll ventilate out. You can close them during storage to keep any insects from building any nests. Our entry door is going to have some resistance to it. It's our friction controlled hinges on here that go ahead and help the wind from slamming that door shut or open or kids, whatever the case may be. We also have our solid steps right here that are nice and convenient. After we level our unit from left to right, well, first off, the way we store them, we flip them up, pull that blue lever right there, and make sure it's locked into the frame. Make sure your door is open all the way so you don't tear up your screen with that bracket right there. Now, when we bring them down, like I was saying, we need to make sure we have our unit leveled. Then we need to come and level our steps. We do that by pulling that blue lever. We can push in these tabs right here and that will allow our legs to come in and out. So we put it down in this position, grab behind it, and we can adjust those legs wherever they need to be in order to level out our steps. We want a good flush threshold right here, that way our door closes properly with no gaps. We also wanna make sure that the frame of our steps isn't damaging the frame of our door by any contact there. As we enter our camper to the direct right, they will have our pantry. Inside there will be our control panel. If we hit these buttons, that will show what our fresh tank, gray tank, black tank, and our battery level are. Our auxiliary will be our second gray tank. And we hit those and our meter will go ahead and pop up with what the current level of that is. We have our water pump, which is that 12 volt pump that's gonna pull from our fresh tank to supply water to our fixtures in our unit. This is an on-demand pump. We wanna make sure that we understand when we turn our faucets on, we're gonna hear it vibrating and pumping that water up and when we turn our faucets off, within a few seconds, it should shut down. Now, if we're certain that we have all our fixtures off, we hear that pump running, it's one of two things. Either our fresh tank is empty and that pump's running, we need to shut it off, or we have a leak in our system. Once again, shutting it off, and then we can investigate. Our water heater has LP gas and electric LP gas. We click it on, our system will light. We may see a DSI fault light right there in the initial beginning. It should shut off and that system will continue to run as long as necessary to go ahead and heat the water. Now, if we continue to see that DSI fault light on, that means that our system hasn't lit, and it could be because we have air in the lines or another fault with the system. Well, we can bleed out the air in the lines of our stovetop. We'll go over that a little bit later. Our water heater is electric as well. We go ahead and have, as long as we're plugged into 110, 
kick that on and that will provide electric heat on that water heater. You can run both of them at the same time if you wish. It'll heat the water up a little bit quicker. We always need to make sure we have water in that tank whenever we operate these. This will operate our cabin lights and this will operate our front cap lights, our awning lights there as well. In order to operate our interior lights, we have that switch right there that also has a dimmer on it as well. Just outside of our pantry, we have our COLP detector to alarm us of any cautious gases. A little green light on there lets us know that it is powered up. It is hardwired into our battery system. We need to be sure we test that audible alarm before we go camping to ensure that it's working and take note of the expiration date, either stamped or the front or the back of it. And note that when it comes around, of course, we need to change it out. 12 volt powered, like I said, in our battery system, we do have smoke detectors in our unit two powered by a nine volt battery. You check the audible alarm and the battery on that on a regular basis as well. Before we enter our bathroom, we have our Coleman Mach AC thermostat right there. It's gonna control the cool and the heat. The heat is only gonna come out of the vents down on the floor level. The cool is gonna come out of our rooftop air. We'll go over that operation right now. All right, this is our thermostat for our AC system. When we click that button once, it'll give us the option for mode. Our first mode is cool. We hit that button again, and then we can choose between high or low auto or high and low all the time. So high and low all the time, we'll keep that fan running constantly, well, even though that compressor is not on, auto will shut that fan off whenever our compressor is turned off. Once we go ahead and initiate those two items, our AC will kick on and we can choose our desired temperature by turning that knob right there. And the larger number on that screen is going to be our room temperature. So here we're set at 63 and our actual temperature is 83. Cool on is gonna show you that that system is initiating and that system will kick on. Our next option on there, if we hit that button twice again, is heat. When we go ahead and click it right there, it will bring on the heat. I show our room temperature as well as our set to temperature. Our heat is only gonna come out of the lower areas. It's not gonna come out of that rooftop AC. If you have air blowing out of that rooftop area, then we wanna make sure that we don't have the fan on high or low on that cool option. So we would go back to our cool and we would check right here and make sure it's on auto. Our last option on here is cool and heat. In this case, we can go ahead and do the same thing, choose our fan options, just have a set temp in between the furnace and the AC, it will keep that temperature set at that 72 degree mark. Now in order to turn that system completely off, click it twice again and we can go to off. Flow out of that system and cool this area off quickly, or we can have them closed and ventilate the air through our AC ducts through the entire unit. Here we are in our bathroom, pretty cut and dry, hot cold faucet right there. We have our shower head with on off button. We can use that to conserve the amount of water we're pulling out of our fresh tank, amount of water we're putting in our gray tank if we are boondocking. It's just an easier way to shut that water off and on in between showering, lathering up and rinsing off rather than having to find that sweet spot on the hot water every time. Now you don't have to use it if you don't want to. If you have a city water and you have a dump station at the campsite, you don't have to use it, right? We're also gonna have a vent in here to go ahead and ventilate while we take a shower. It helps reduce the risk for mold and mildew in this area. Have our toilet right here, push pedal right here to flush it. It is pretty simple, right? We're putting number one and number two in there, liquids and solids. Liquids, hit that pedal, flush it, you're good to go. Solids, we need to fill that bowl about half to three quarters of the way to make sure we have enough water to push those solids down the drain. We can do that by barely pressing down that pedal right there. You'll see the water start to come out and that valve still being closed. We can fill that water up and flush those solids down the drain. Now, in addition to solids, of course, we're gonna have RV toilet paper. Make sure it is RV toilet paper. If you use anything else, it may not decompose in that tank. We also wanna throw our chemicals in there as well, so it'll help decompose anything that's in that system. Lastly, in here, we do have our main GFCI receptacle. We'll go over the information on that right now. Our GFCI outlet right here is going to control all those outlets in wet locations, in our kitchen, outside, anywhere where you see a label saying GFCI protected. Uh, in the event that these outlets are overloaded with too many skillets, coffee makers, or anything of that nature, this system will trip. And also, if those outlets get wet, this system will trip too. So this is where basically it's like a breaker on here. You have two buttons, your reset button, your test button. If we hit that test button, it's gonna initiate like that system is tripped and it's gonna kill all those outlets. <clears throat> In the event that happens, 
and your system trips we come over here we hit that reset button we'll see that green light pop back on and you're good to go if it immediately trips again then we want to go remove some of those appliances we have on there or make sure that none of those outlets are wet our couch does fold out into bed remove these cushions pull this out lay it out into a bed we also have sleeping op sleeping options in our dinette by removing the two posts on our table dropping it down on the bumpers moving our cushions over and we can have more sleeping option there. This is our ceiling assembly for our AC. We'll notice that we do have two filters right here. We push these tabs, we can clean those filters out so we're not restricting air to our AC. On here also, you're gonna see vents. These are our quick dump vents right here. If we open those up, that air will, for our entertainment, we have our TV system be mounted right here. We have our satellite and cable and antenna power right here with our hookups you'll find a little button on here with light that turns off and on. That light indicates a antenna boost. When we are using or scanning for antenna channels, we want to make sure that light is on so it'll help pick up more channels in the area that we're at. If we want to scan for cable channels, we have cable at the campground, push that button, that light will turn off and turn off your antenna boost so we don't scramble those channels coming in from the campsite. We're also going to have our 110 fireplace right here. If for electric heat, we'll go over the operation of that now. Here we have our fireplace. We have a sensor right up here in the top right. We have to aim that remote at to turn it on. We have our Celsius and Fahrenheit temperature we can change to. And right here, this little flame icon is going to change the dimness of our flame. If we want to change the lighting of our flame, we hit the light bulb on the screen down here at the bottom. And it'll give you some different options right there. If we want to operate our heater on a timer, once again, electric heater, it is going to be this button right here. It looks like a clock. And when we push it, we can see some times pop up, one hour, two hours, three hours, all the way up to eight. And then it will go to zero hours, letting you know that that timer is off. If we want to change our temperature, we'll use one of these two buttons at the bottom. And we can see, once again, we have a temperature down there and we will go ahead and raise it until it kicks on or lower it we want it to kick off or we can keep going until it says on and that heater will stay running all the time we kick it up one more time and it's going to say of meaning that that system you're also going to have the opportunity to upgrade to the wine guard lte wireless router system if you wish we're already pre-wired for that and that would go ahead and give you the option to install that router and have wi-fi with you wherever you go if you want to get that subscription we have our 12 volt refrigerator right here, operational knob right here and right here for our temp controls and we can turn that system off. We also have our travel latch right here to help keep that door closed while on travel. Now, just like our outside fridge, we need to make sure we defrost this, clean it out, reduce the opportunity for mold and mildew, make sure we're getting all the water out of there so it doesn't damage our wood components around that fridge because once again, manufacturer is not gonna participate in that kind of damage. We have our Suburban cooktop right here with our glass, glass cover that gives us more counter space. And that is also how it needs to be when we travel. We go ahead and flip it up for use. We come to our knobs right here, turn them to our light option. Then we go ahead and crank our igniter knob. Now we need to, of course, make sure our propane tanks are on in order for that to operate. Now we talked a little bit about air and the lines when we talked about the water heater. That happens when we store our unit and we turned our propane tanks off, which is perfectly normal and common. When we turn it back on, we're gonna have air in our system. We can also have that whenever we run out of propane, we replace our tanks, stuff like that. So to get that air out of there, we just come over here and we light our stove. Turn your propane tanks on, come over here, light the stove, and then that's it. It may take a little bit longer to light it because we're bleeding that air out, but once you've done it, you don't have to do it again until, of course, you store your unit or you've run out of gas. Easy, convenient way of doing it. We also want to make sure we do that before we operate things like our water heater or our furnace so they don't go into a fault mode due to that air in the system. We're also going to have our oven down here at the bottom. Very similar situation. We go to pilot on. We go ahead and crank it until that pilot light lights. We hold it down. We have to hold, keep holding this push button down on that knob for that pilot to stay lit. Once it's lit, let it run for about 20 seconds, then turn to your temperature. You should see that burner tube light up, close your oven, and you're ready to cook. Down below that 12 volt refrigerator, we have our 110 breaker panel, all labeled for our 110 components. 
and then we have our 12 volt components right here on our fuses in the event that we have any issues this is where we want to go to try to start troubleshooting not too much to go over in our bedroom a second ac system controlled by a second thermostat right here by the bed that'll work just like the rear one except this one's only going to have cool no heat the heat will only be controlled by that other one and it'll control it for the entire camper over here we have our backer location for our tv as well as another cable antenna output for it too well we hope you found that resourceful but wait there's more information on our great american rv youtube channel this channel right here find the playlist haps helpful hacks we go over different products in this unit and we'll take a deeper dive with more diagnostics more information as well as helpful tips when you're out camping tell your buddies tell your friends like share subscribe do all those awesome things on youtube tiktok wherever you found us and keep watching here at great american rv superstores where we bring the how-to to you